Hey, investors, have you ever wondered how to build a wine and whiskey investment collection? Did you know that a study of high net worth individuals has shown that nearly one in three people in this sector have done this very thing? See, in this week's episode of Making Billions, I bring on my dear friend Maxwell Neat. Maxwell is building a massive alternative investment around wine and whiskey. He is meeting the demand that so many high net worth people are looking for and by so doing has built a reputation in this industry as being an expert. Join Maxwell and me as we discuss critical factors in succeeding in this space as an investor and how he's even publishing a book to help even more of us in our pursuit of making billions. Here we go. Hey, welcome to another episode of Making Billions. I'm your host, Ryan Miller, and today I have my dear friend, Maxwell Nee. Maxwell is the Managing General Partner of Oeno Wine and Whiskey Investment Fund. It's an estimated $100 million fund that focuses on building double-digit returns in the wine and whiskey investment space. So what this means is Maxwell is a multi-award-winning entrepreneur who earns his investors a market-beating return with wine and whiskey alternative investments. So Maxwell, welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you. And, uh, you know, you and I have got to know each other a little bit offline, and I'm so impressed. This is one of the coolest things, an investment fund in the private investment space on wine and whiskey. I'm sure our fans around the world, we got people in about 100 different countries right now. I think we would all like to know how the heck did you even get into being an expert in wine and whiskey, let alone build a fund and produce double digit returns? So where did it begin for you? Yeah, great question. So uh, I've always loved investments. You know, I studied finance, spent five years in corporate banking. That's like one half of my career. The second half of my career was I fell into the world of um, online business coaching, you know, helping people to build their businesses online. I quickly learned that, you know, business coaching, it's, it's a really good business to generate a lot of cash revenue but um, it's not so easy to build an asset. So the business did really well um, because I've, you know, I, I am obsessed with finding pockets of opportunity, you know, inefficiencies in the market. We managed to execute this strategy that grew profitability by 300% in five months, which, you know, uh, that's why I won a few awards for um, being an entrepreneur. And then, so I had like some cash and I didn't know where to put it. So I started to look at different types of investments and, you know, real estate is, yeah, I've got some in real estate, got some in, in, in ETFs at the time, did really, really crap. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm out of those now. And then I go to Chicago and I'm meeting my friend uh, who I haven't seen in a long time. And we're at this bar and the, the bartender says, you know, it's a really nice, classy, chic bar. Bartender says, what do you want to drink? I said, an old fashioned. And old fashioned is a drink, a cocktail usually made with bourbon. Um, but I like it with Scotch whiskey because I'm, I'm a European snob, obviously. <laughs> and uh, he said, great. So do you want it with Macallan 12 or Macallan 18? So Macallan's like the Ferrari of the whiskey world. Everyone knows it. It's, you know, really high price, good quality. And the difference between the 12 and the 18 is that the 12 is 12 years old and 18 is 18 years old. So six years of difference of aging, the same, but the same liquid, right? Literally just sitting in a warehouse for six more years. And I said, look, you know what? I'm on holiday. Let's do, um, let's do the 18. So I grab the 18, I drink it, it's delicious. You know, give it to my friend. He doesn't like whiskeys. He said he's not sure he drinks it. It's delicious. You know, he drinks like half of it, right? And then I go to the bartender, <laughs> say to the bartender, hey, so, um, you know, how much was this again? And he said, 125. And then I said, no, 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 not the tab, not the whole tab, you know. Uh, how much was this Macallan 18 old fashioned? And he said, 125. And then my friend starts laughing at me. I thought, wow, well, I'm committed now. So, you know, I've got to buy this drink. And then I asked him, how much was the, tw was the 12? And he said, 25. And then I thought, holy crap, just the difference of six years of aging equals a 500% difference in the price. You know, 500% difference in the investment if you were holding this barrel for yourself. That experience plus a few others, you know, I've always heard the story, you know, ages like fine wine. You know, if I've heard about wine investment, ages like whiskey, you know, you buy it young, you buy it in the barrel, then you sell it in the bottle and you make a, a huge gain. Like I've always had that in the back of my head, but it was this experience that sort of really opened my eyes to, you know, 
aging creates so much value with like predictable value in these assets because you can't cheat time you know no one can cheat time add extra numbers because you can tell the difference that's what opened my eyes to the world of wine and whiskey investment man that's phenomenal so uh, what a cool story where you just you it's funny you're you're just having a good time with one of your friends and then you started to do the math like all good investors and entrepreneurs you're just like wait a minute you found this little gap to say if you go from 12 to 18 in this sector, you get a 5x multiple just for holding that. That is a phenomenal return. And then you got... So now you took this good idea and you figured out an investment thesis and then you created this investment fund. Maybe walk us through about a little bit of the investment fund and how how that got started. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've basically jumped all in into this world. You know, a lot of people ask me why, you know, I had a successful business and, and you know, banking career, that type of thing. And I want to share that um, it's because it aligns with my values, you know, uh, my top three values. So my first value is uh, freedom. You know, that's what investing represents for me. It represents you know, putting money away so you have more freedom, more options later. Uh, second value is uh, experiences. You know, like I would never buy a Lamborghini, just have no desire. But would I rent one for a month to experience it? Hell yes, right? So, and I get to share that with my clients, you know, wine, whiskey, drinking with them, talking and stuff. And the last one is relationships. You know, I only want to have clients and deal with people that I want to spend more time with, that I would hang out with on the weekend, that I'd share a bottle with, you know, after work hours, you know, and like I want to have people that um, I want to invest more time with in that. And I get to meet, I get to tick all three, scratch the itch on all three in this business. So that's, that's why I love this so much. And since throwing myself in, you know, um, I'm the managing partner at um, Aweno. The company's been around for about nine years now. We've got about a um, hundred, more than a hundred full-time staff and four continents speaking six languages to um to facilitate the returns that we give to our investors i threw myself in because i just saw so much potential you know i saw a huge pocket of opportunity i saw a huge problem that we could solve for the industry you know getting the best stock aging it at highest quality because the the most heartbreaking thing is when an investor buys stock they take it home you know they keep it in their garage or like their shed or whatever or underneath and then there's there's some humidity that comes in or mold that comes in and then we've got to throw that stock away like there's so much wastage and breakages that happen and you know the investment fund and everything solves all of that um for the investor for restaurants that want to have this on their menu and uh, and for us to help distribute, you know, these amazing products. Phenomenal. So you, you've created that vehicle. You know, maybe you can help me understand, like, what are some of the things that you're seeing in the wine and whiskey investment space right now? I'll start with whiskey, you know. So our fund is split 70, 70, 30, 70% wine, 30% whiskey. The reason for that is that we're working backwards from demand of um, a particular menu. So if you go to a Michelin style restaurant, as an example, you'll notice that there's twice as much wine on the menu than there is whiskey. That's because there's at least twice as many wine drinkers in the world than there are whiskey. So you always got to work backwards from the end consumer. The end consumer right now is consuming a lot of Irish whiskey. So Irish whiskey doesn't have the thousand years of high quality branding that um, Scotch whiskey has, but it's smoother sweeter drinkers would call it more approachable easier to drink and um, then scotch whiskey uh, even if it's the same age and what that does is that that opens it up to a larger taste palette and larger audience to, to grab larger market share so you know, there was an article from bloomberg saying that um, irish whiskey makers are suffering from a shortage of supply and they can't keep up with the demand and that's happening with yeah that's happening with irish whiskey that's happening with uh whiskey bourbon as well you know high quality bourbon it's not easy to get your hands on uh, and the, and you'll see the prices going up and that's because um there's more drinkers now than what they made five years ago because bourbon takes about four or five years to age and so they've got like a five-year problem that they're trying to solve right now and and we help them solve that problem as well phenomenal and you know i th i think you're hitting it right at a perfect time you and i were talking uh, offline and you know we're both seeing that uh, alternatives which i would certainly say you are alternative investments in the private sector are really starting to to fly and I think we're just coming into the golden age of alternative investments. Just with inflation, the minimum $1 million net worth for accredited investors, that hasn't changed. So in other words, more people are, are starting to move up into the accredited status. And the income side, you know, 200K, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. The 200K. So these are things that are allowing more people to enter in the private investment space to make those superior returns. And these alternative investments, when you're able to provide those during the golden age, you're in a good position. You know, what have you found that are some key factors in making successful investments in this space? Yeah. So when we talk about wine and whiskey investment, you know, we talk about the top 1%. So the industry is about 450, call it $450 billion of wine and whiskey. And the top 1% is, yeah, you know, just under $5 billion. You know, we're not talking about things that people drink and use in mixes and things like that. We're talking about what would be considered like modern day luxuries, you know, and they don't have to be, you know, $10,000 a bottle. They can be starting at $100 a bottle. What's also really exciting about this space is that because these are considered modern day luxuries, these these alcohols, drinking habits, you know, what do we learn in economics, um, alcohol and cigarette site? the two only inelastic goods. So it's got that benefit as well. Because these assets are in the luxury economy, they benefit from being in their own bubble. Um, You know, for example, last year we saw stock markets, uh, you know, shares drop from 30 to 60% um, across, you know, multiple industries. Um, But at the same time, who's the richest person in the world right now? It's Bernard Arnold, you know, the uh, the godfather of luxury, you know, driving the ship of Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy. So he's positioned himself very well to excel in a contracting economy. So these assets are positioned in the same way as well. You mentioned earlier about Irish whiskey and there's certain suppliers that just can't keep up. Are you finding like what what is the impact is that uh, key investments are made? Do you see it better to focus on the supply side or the demand side? Where, where's kind of the sweet spot to, to focus if you're an investor? Yeah, it's always a supply side. So if you think about it in simple math, right? You know, if you want the price of your bottle of wine or your bottle of whiskey to double in price in five years basically what you're what you're looking for is there to be twice as many drinkers today between today and tomorrow uh today and five years from now or for supply to drop twice as fast as as it normally would drop you know and and that's a beautiful thing about these assets you know if i want to go out there and 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 improve the the climate for our investors all i need to do is just buy some bottles of wine and whiskey and start drinking um, because the it, it takes 10 years to make some of this stuff and 10 seconds to drink it. So um, it, supply can move very, very quickly if you know where the future sort of gaps in the market are and is. You know, there was articles that came out before Christmas, um, champagne shortages, um, you know, Irish whiskey shortages, bourbon shortages. There's articles coming out that uh, there's climate change impacting the south of France where some of the best wine in the world is made. And so all of that's impacting supply. So if you're holding on to the golden bottle um, when there's when it's, it becomes very scarce in the market, you know you put yourself in a very very good position. So supply side is is uh, where you spend a lot of your time uh, forecasting uh, your own price models. So yeah, no, I get it. And you know now that you've built a fund. Uh, typically, it's no one does that as an island, right? They're not alone. How important has it been for you in building your fund and, and achieving returns for investors? How important it, has it been for you in building a team? Maybe we could talk about your team a little bit. The business has been operating for nine years now. And, um, you know, it's a huge enterprise. You know, we don't have the numbers for 2022 yet. Um, I'll share them later. Uh, but in 2021, we did just above 15% for our portfolio of private wine collectors, investors. So this is not in a fund, this is in, a, in like an SMA, separate managed account. We were able to achieve that because we've got some amazing people on the team. You know, I'm I'm not the technical genius, I'm not the technical quant. You know, the technical genius is a gentleman called Justin Nock. Uh, Justin Nock has MW after his name, which stands for Master of Wine. How cool is that? He's a master of wine. He's like a Jedi of wine. and there's act fun fact. There's actually more astronauts in the world than there are masters of wine. Like it's a very very hard accolade to get your hands on. And Justin's been in the industry for 25 plus years. So you know all the all the deals that we do, getting a hold of this you know really really great stock that's going to appreciate in value. It's all done off market. You know it's an extremely inefficient market. There's no marketplace. If you go to the marketplace, you're going to overpay. So we get in there. We get in there early. We get in there um, cheaper and, and, you know, pass that asset margin basically to the investor. You know, and Justin's been doing that for 25 years. You know, he, we're, we're basically buying into relationships that were built two decades ago. You know, so 
he's 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 critical to the business um, and the fund. And then we also have our fund manager, Michael Doa, who is like the steady hand. So he's like the steady hand, the CEO of the company, founder of the company. And um, he's the guy that gets the phone call for the best stock. You know, like, for example, there, I'll tell you the story. There's a, a, um, a person in, um, in Switzerland that wanted to exit some stock. They owed some money to the bank. Um, so then they called Michael. They said, hey, Michael, can you help us exit the stock? And he said, look, we can exit the stock, but we're, we're going to we're gonna be really sharp with the pricing because, you know, we want to give our investors a good deal. So he gets those types of phone calls, off-market phone calls, which is incredible. And uh, Michael actually won, you know, one investment advisor of the year um, last year and, and this year uh, from the Spears 500 magazine. And I'm the entrepreneur, you know, behind this, you know, delivering the fund, bringing it to um, Delaware, you know, we're set up in Delaware and there's more people to the team, but that gives you the high level of, you know, the the players on the field. You know, I got, a, got the picture of basketball in my head right now, you know, the four players on the field that are passing the ball, scoring the goals for the for the team. Man, that's incredible. So building that team, I had no idea that Master of Wine is, is there's more astronauts than people with that. So that that's incredible. So having an effective team, both on finance as well as um, understanding the asset that you're investing in. So we would call that the expert investor and fund manager. I mean, man, you're firing on all cylinders. This is great. So, you know, as we wrap things up, I'm wondering if you could share maybe like Two or three things that you found uh, that is helpful for people when trying to approach the wine and whiskey space as far as an investment standpoint, not only a, a taste or you know a lifestyle choice, but how do we make money in this sector? Maybe you can distill it down to, yes, pun intended, distill it down to two or three things <laughs> that uh, you found to, to be some critical success factors in, in making money in the sector. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful question. Okay, so um, this will be controversial to most wine investor collectors, um, but you know it's really key. And I actually published as a chapter in my book called "The Wine Investor's Playbook" that it will be out sometime this year. And um, the chapter is called "Buying the Best is the Worst Thing That You Can Do," right? Which normally sort of rattles people's brains a little bit. But basically, if you want to beat the market, if you want, you know, the the industry generally averages about eight percent a year minimum. If you want to, if you want to exceed that, if you want out, you know, alpha on top of that in the wine world, um, you can't just buy the best because everyone wants to buy the best. So everyone's doing it. That's a bit like the S and P, um, you know, like the benchmark. And also, there's also a really harmful thing about buying the best because remember what drives up the price of these assets is when people drink them. You know, there's there was 300 bottles last year. Now there's only 50. You know that that becomes very scarce. Um, when you buy the best, everyone wants them. Everyone wants to collect them. Everyone wants to hold them, show them off to their friends. They're more like pieces of art, you know, compared to bottles of wine uh, or whiskey, which means that no one drinks them. You know, it's like, like there's bottles, some of these bottles are sitting around and no one ever dares to drink them because they spent so much money, they're worth so much. So, which means that as an investor, um, it also creates a, an illiquid market. You know, like it's quite hard for you to exit some of these high end bottles because, you know, people think, oh, yeah, but then I'm never going to drink it. So what's the point in buying it? So you sort of want that sweet spot of what people are drinking, plus extremely great brand, you know, um, is has a great track record for improving in price. So that, that that's one part. Um, and then the next part is, you know, if you wanted like a hot tip, um, I definitely put your eyes on champagne right now. Uh, so champagne's gone up you know, more than 30% in, um, and that's champagne, like as an industry. Any, any brands that uh, you like in champagne or whiskey, wine, anything? There, there is, you know, like one that everyone would know that people, you know, might not have thought is a fine wine investment was Dom Perignon. You know, Dom Perignon is a, is a great investment, especially if you get into a good vintage. Uh, I can share people offline, you know, which ones are the best ones to get your hands on. But basically, champagne's got more than 30% the last 12 months and it went up again, um, it jumped up again, you know, just before, just after COVID ended. And you got to ask yourself why, right? You know, people are coming out of their houses for the first time all over the world, you know, billion, billions of people coming out of their houses, you know, like, like no one's business, traveling for the first time in two, three years. What are they doing? They think, oh, I'm going to celebrate. You know, people were having this, there's three years of weddings happening in one year, all clumped together because they didn't get to happen the last three years. Baby showers, birthdays, what's, what's the first thing you do? You toast with champagne, you know? Um, when you haven't traveled in a while, you might upgrade your flight. 
you know, you might upgrade to business class. Um, and what's the first thing you do? You go to the lounge, they offer you champagne. You know, you get onto the plane, the first thing they do, they offer you champagne, you know, so you've already opened two bottles, right? And then what's the next thing you do when you land, you get into the chauffeur, he offers you champagne, you go to the hotel and he offers you champagne, right? And then you're there for your friend's wedding in Tulum or, or Bali or Mexico or wherever you are, and you're toasting of champagne, and then you go to the after party at the club and you're drinking champagne. So, so champagne is, um, you know, exceeding expectations as a, as a fine wine investment. And, um, and it's, it's really simple as to why. Um, so that's a bit like the hot tip, but, um, the hot tip, uh, for people who like, like when I was starting off in my career, right. I don't know why, but I had this intuition that, you know, proximity was really, really valuable, you know, like, like I didn't come from, you know, the, the rich private school, the rich family or, or, or whatever have you. But I just, I just had an intuition that if I could, um, you know, surround myself with people that were inspiring and that pushed me and motivated me that I'm just going to play higher and, you know, have great relationships and, and, and it's going to pay off in some way. I didn't quite know how. So I have a genuine interest in this, like a real genuine interest. Um, so when I started off my corporate job, um, I was underqualified for it. You know, I actually graduated with a GPA um, that was below satisfactory. The satisfactory GPA is four. I graduated with 3.6 because I, when I failed, I failed hard. And when I passed, I, I passed small. <laughs> I passed just above the, the, the pass line. Um, and then I, I realized, holy crap, like I need to network my way into a good job because I'm not going to get it otherwise. So as a poor uni student, I spent a thousand dollars buying people coffee off this whole floor and I was rejected. I was rejected 37 times from the same job, but I just kept meeting people and kept, you know, learning and learning. I just like, you know, what can this person teach me? What can they teach me? I didn't have, I didn't have anything to offer at that point in time, you know, being the uni student and this is the corporate professional, but you know, I, I've always loved learning, um, but practical stuff. I hated learning in school. I loved learning practical stuff. So, so I, I translated that into um, business and all that sort of stuff. Like, um, here's one thing that I that I always do, always, always do. Whether I'm flying business class or not, I will go to the airport lounge and I'll pay the hundred dollars access to the lounge, and then I will go there early, like five hours early, and talk to every single person there because I have like this thesis. I'm going to meet interesting people there. I could probably help them with a few digital marketing things every now and then because I'm I'm a younger digital marketing type of guy and these are usually older CEO types of guys. Um, if not, then um, I'll buy them a coffee at a random cafe, you know, based on they walk in in a, in a suit carrying a briefcase, you know. Um, they might have like a nice watch on um, and so and I can talk about watches. I like watches as well, so it's a common interest. And, um, you know, I bridge gaps that way. And, you know, you might not get a sale today or a sale tomorrow, but it's not about that. You know, it's about you paid $5 for this coffee to have an extraordinary conversation with someone that inspires me. And that's the, that's the cheapest coffee I've ever bought for anyone in my life. Yeah, that's pretty good return on investment. And, uh, you know, I actually talked about this in my early days. It's actually a very similar story. I would take people out and, and uh, I... It's it's funny. I'm going to bring this up. So I was in Mexico at, a, at an investor event, um, and there were people cheersing these three stories um, from from my earlier episodes of my podcast. One of my first episodes, which was about how I, you know, how you I went about building connections and reputation and relationships, and I had this principle similar to yours: was never eat alone. Always ask people about their story. And be generous. And so by never eating alone, buying people coffee, it was just a great way when you don't have a lot to offer other than a listening ear. And uh, a lot of these people at the top of their game can feel kind of lonely sometimes. And and so that's number one. Number two, a lot of them, if they're in a good, you know, mental, spiritual space, that they're actually very willing to help the next generation. And I found that out very early is if you can get some time with these people, even by, you know, I'm in Canada, so offering, making them an offer they can't refuse, which is a, a warm drink in frozen tundra of Canada. I mean, these people will, yeah, for three bucks, you can build a connection and you just offer generously to support them in whatever it is they're trying to do. At the time, that was me building financial models and just helping them to, you know, discuss risks and, and financial pitfalls. 
And by doing that, I was able to build a lot of connections in that space. So as we wrap things up, is there any final thoughts? Uh, any, you know, is there a way that people can reach out to you if they want to learn more about what you're up to or um, how, how, how can people connect with you? Yeah, so I'll share some links. Um, you know, the, I'm most active on LinkedIn. So if you just Google me or, or LinkedIn me, you'll see, you'll see my past life, my past business. I'm all over YouTube there actually, but um, Maxwell and me, if you Google me on LinkedIn. Um, I read it, check it every day. Um, I'm a bit addicted to it. So that's good, good, um, responsive rate, customer service rate for, for anyone listening. You know, as, as we wrap things up, just to conclude, um, you know, listening to advice from Maxwell, focus on supply, be a contrarian investor in this space. Number two is gain access to key information, uh, understand your market, understand the people who also understand your market. Building that team is a great way to gain access to information. And then number three, Build your network in creative ways. You do these things and you too will be well on your way in your pursuit of making billions. 